What I'm going to quickly go to right now, though, is, as promised last hour, Brett and I have been uh, yabbering on about all the things we've been doing this year, what we, what's coming up soon. We really haven't touched on the stuff that's going on in international motorsport, which we'll do. But uh, one of the big subjects in the uh, area this year, Brett and I were just talking about, and in the last couple of weeks, is the Cadinia Motorsport Recreation Complex. You're excited about Brett. We're wrapped to see it. Um, yeah, Podium One's going to be in touch with you soon, aren't they? We hope so. Yeah, we hope to have something from them. We hope to have someone in here today, actually, but they just couldn't. Uh, they couldn't make it. But certainly in the new series of In Pit Lane, when we hopefully come back in March, we will have uh, some some more news. It'll be further along the advanced along the track too. So we'll have a bit more news and a bit more sort of firm news as to what's happening with the with the project with the people from Podium One and and find out you know who they are. And but as you said, you went out and you spoke to the, the council. And um, yeah, this is uh, this will be everything. I haven't heard this, so I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it is, Brett. This is uh, Councillor Brett Owen, who is on the steering committee for uh, the Cadinia uh, the Council, and he was enthusiastic about the uh, the complex that they're in, the, um, also the approvals that they're, and the process they're going through, and I'm just going to play for that right now. Doc here from Inpit Lane, and I'm wrapped just around the corner, right outside my doorstep this morning. I've dropped down to Cadinia uh, Shire Council, and I'm catching up with Councillor Brett Owen, who is head of the steering committee and a long-time representative and has a lot of heritage in the area. Councillor Brett Owen, welcome to Inpit Lane, and thanks for joining me today. Uh, thanks, Doc, for having me. It's really great to speak to you and talk about what's happening in Cadinia. Thank you. Cool. Um, so... The, obviously, this, this has been proposed for, I think, 12 months. Podium One did a media release uh, uh, earlier on the year or late last year. Uh, what did they put forward to you on, to Council on Monday and what have you, has the Council approved so far? Yeah, thanks, Doc. Um, so, long story, and I'll try and be brief, but uh, Council purchased uh, this large piece of land in McGregor, McGregor Road, Pakenham, um, back in 2004. And since then, we've been working through the planning process, uh, um, uh, the proposed sale. And on Monday night, uh, we adopted the Cardinia Motor Recreation and Education Park Development Plan. So that is um, uh, basically the plan, master plan, um, basically, in relation to what's proposed on that large parcel of land, what uh, Podium, Podium One is talking about, what the Packenham Auto Club is talking about, and the Kurup and District Motorcycle Club, what they're hoping to do. So it sets the parameters of what's, um, what's going to be there. It um, there sounds, is, sounds exciting for yep. all the parties so far and and uh, there's a lot of support that's gaining around the momentum around the uh, the city of Casey and, and obviously surrounding district. Uh, the, has all, all the biodiversity um, uh, checks been done, uh, the, the noise levels, etc. like that? So that was part of the proposal as well though too? So that comes later. Um, so uh, Podium 1 still requires a planning permit um, to roll out what they're proposing. Uh, the development plan was needed to set those parameters, those guidelines, but uh, in relation to the specific aspects of it, they do need a planning permit. So uh, if a environment effects statement is required, um, if one is required, um, then they will need to address those um, sort of requirements does that through come, the planning process. Does that come to Casey Council or I'm told some of these projects, if they get too large outside a certain um, parameter, the state government also has to approve as well too? Or do you give approval and it goes to them anyway? So cut in your shire. Um, so we, we will uh, assess the planning permit, but there'll be a number of referrals agencies of see the EPA um, and if a environment effects statement is required uh, then that will sort of set out sort of conditions of a planning permit if one was to be issued so so that gives people some reassurance that um, that uh, you know whether it's noise levels or the impact on the environment um, those things need to be addressed through through such a, a statement we need everything to be done and, and yeah. done properly and obviously done in depth to the extent to satisfy everything for for the, obviously the benefit of everyone that's going to be involved and also you know projecting forward you know if this complex goes ahead it's going to have a 50,000 uh, grant uh, per person available stand so uh, it's going to have a diverse amount of uh, uh, recreational use as well too it's not just going to be a racetrack there's going to be uh, educational facilities as well though too for to, for people for driving uh, it's going to have a, and, a, and a couple of clubs that are, are absolutely wrapped to be taking the next step in the local area that have been around for, as you said, uh, off, off uh, air, 
uh, decades that uh, need some uh, need some support for their recreational use and their hobbies. Yeah, thank you, Doc. And I really think it's really important that we don't forget about our two local motorsports clubs. So that's the Packenham Auto Club and also the Curry Rup and District Motorcycle Club. And and as part of the development plan we adopted on Monday night, it does include those two clubs. They've got different land parcels, and so that plan sort of uh, provides the framework about you know what's appropriate on their sites. They too will have to apply for planning permit uh, approvals, whether it's you know um, you know building of um, uh, accommodation and so forth like that so uh, this allows those two clubs to progress so uh, Packham Auto Club are extremely happy uh, they've got a site for them to have their long term use of, uh, for motorsports they're currently designing um, their tracks and what their site's going to look like. Um, and you said they've got, got 300, around 300 members yeah, at this stage? Yeah, and so. this is over 300 you know, members. And, and what I like about it is that they've got a lot of young people as well, and it gives them the discipline of you know respect for vehicles and driving and so forth. Like it that. is. A great club. Because great there, club. There, there are certain patches around Victoria that mm. uh, don't have these facilities or don't have these clubs or associations to belong to. And it's been well known that um, the education is the provider of, of a better society. Like, for example, um, you can go up to Decker up in Shepparton and they have a, had a driving academy for, dec uh, for years up there and it's ex extremely successful. And I know that, uh, you know, northern suburbs have had their problems or the western suburbs as well, though, too. But it's obviously wildly renowned that if we have these educational facilities in place and these associations and, and involving uh, sometimes, obviously, the law, um, you know, the police are involved. It's it's fantastic because then you find it affects the whole um, surrounding area and and the, as in the residents and the and the rate payers and, and everyone benefits from it, don't they? Definitely, Doc. And uh, same with motor uh, motorcycles. Um, the Cure Up Motorcycle uh, Club have got some land as part of this, but. Um it's not enough in size area. It's very uh, constrained and, and encumbered. So they've got a section of this land for their use, but it's not big enough. So council is committed to working with them, and that steering group that I'm part of is uh, committed to working with them to find another site. Um, and we'll continue to work very hard so we can find that second site so they can have that long-term use. I imagine they probably wouldn't be too far away from this one anyway, down the track, because if they can find somewhere in the proximity of this, yes. this beautiful complex it's you know it seems to have uh, no, not leaps and bounds ahead of some of the other proposals in the past but it certainly um, has a, a, a stronger base uh, from the podium one consortium themselves and also from uh, the, the support of council here which is fantastic and I've um, just uh, I've, I know we're on air right now but I'd also like to mention uh, two of the other councils I've spoke to. One of them I've been friends with for many years, and that's uh, the uh, ex-mayor, Graham Moore. And uh, he's wholeheartedly behind it. He's a, 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 a petrol head from way back, but I, I hope he's mellowed in his years as well too, like we all try and do. He has. And, <laughs> and also uh, Councillor Colin Ross, Deputy Mayor for last year as well. And he's he's a, a massive supporter. And, and uh, it is. It's, it's, it's a huge community. The, uh, the Shire of Casey... Uh, sorry, the uh, Shire of Cadinia is growing into right now. And um, I think someone just quoted me the other day that uh, I think it might have even been Graham when I was talking to him on the phone. Uh, the Shire of, of Cadinia and Casey combined has got more population than Tasmania now. So, yes, yes that's uh, definitely correct. You, you, you need these, um, these uh, facilities and these hobbies and these outlets for people to be able to do uh, and, and provide as well not just the, the balance between nature and, and residential and commercial in the area you've got to have outlets for people to be able to uh, for recreational use and, and these this proposal sounds really good and uh council you're full full fully behind it obviously and how many is on the steering committee with you uh, so it's councillor uh, ray brown and myself and obviously the two local clubs are represented uh, podium one does uh, come to the steering group on occasions um and also the relevant council staff whether it's the planning and governance and and the engineering as well um, but this will be a world-class facility the podium one uh, this will be great for tourism and also jobs, you know, no doubt about that. We need jobs in our shire. Um, you know, we're growing. We want people to work locally if they can and not travel on that Monash. So um, so that will be really great. It's going to be a great a great thing for Cardinia Shire. Over $200 million uh, worth of spend. I, yeah, I think I saw that. That's just uh, an interview that I did with uh, Councillor 
Brett Owen for uh, po- uh, for the proposal that's uh, outlined uh, earlier this week. And I apologise for all the ums and ahs because I don't do it on TV anymore. I'm not doing it on radio right now. And I don't even know why I was doing it then because I was just sitting there just uh, casually having a chat with him. And I reckon I racked up about a thousand ums and ahs, which I don't usually do, do I, that? these days, Brett. <laughs> well, I can do that for you, so... <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said. I'm on air right now and I don't um and ah. I do the occasional one, but not much, uh, not much. But then, for some reason, I was just going um and ah and ah and ah and um. So, yeah, huge apologies. But, look, anyway, um, yeah, they're, they're really enthusiastic about it anyway. Yeah, I think the point that he made is a very good one, that uh, in terms of creating jobs in the area. As you said earlier in the program, we were up at Winton last week for Formula SAE. Now, you well know we had an awful lot of trouble finding suitable accommodation up there because accommodation just right throughout that region was totally booked out. And this isn't a a supercar event. This isn't something that attracted a crowd of 30 or 40,000. This was, you know, a a big-ish event but even a round of the state championship, they'll have you know, 280, 300 cars. Those 300 cars, they're going to come from all over Victoria. Some are going to come from interstate. A lot of them are going to want to stay in the area. A lot of them are going to bring their friends, their crew. I was their about crew to say, it's not their friends. Three, that's not 300. You need to multiply it out with all those categories that you just said. You've got friend, you've got kids, you've got wives, you've got friends, you've got support crew, you've got pits. So on Officials, the average, on the average, media. on the average, it's 300 plus. Point three or point four, because they're at least going to bring half a dozen people around about as, as a proximity with them, aren't they? So, yeah, And that's what they, they found. The Confederation of Australian Motorsports, soon to become Motorsport Australia, have um, commission, commissioned earlier or late last year a an examination into the economic impact that motorsport has. And it was a very narrowly defined, you know, being that it was a CAMS thing, they only really looked at CAMS-related motorsport, but CAMS is only one area of the sport. Yeah. But even just that in itself, the contribution it made in terms of economic impact for Australia in terms of not just local jobs, but also its contribution to the export market. I mean, earlier this year, we did the Australian Automotive Aftermarket Expo. You, you came there, and you saw companies there, and we saw them once again at Formula SA at the tray on the networking night. Companies like Motec and... Uh, you you, for, you and, forget how many companies are involved yeah, in, 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 in the industry full stop. There was Siemens there, there was Motec, there was... there were, Yeah, there were the multinational motorsport car, or the car companies and the vehicle companies companies around the world that we all drive in from day to day or we all get around society in but uh, you forget there was Australian Defence Force who what what, you you first thought you have to second guess yourself and go oh yeah I know why they're here because they want to they want to take advantage of the new recruits that are going to come out of university that are keen and eager with all the fresh ideas and and the education that they've got to be able to put the best forward to be able to make the world turn around. The, the other thing is motorsport, as as we said, if people watched our show on Thursday night, we had a, a package that we got from Volkswagen regarding their IDR, their, their all-electric record-breaking car, and they were talking about the incredible contribution that motorsport has made in the development of electric cars. Toyota won Le Mans this year at a record pace, sort of near record pace, with a car that used less than half the fuel as the car that won Le Mans five years ago. And that's just... When, think about that. This is a 24-hour race. They've used half as much fuel because of the development of the hybrid technology. And it, you know, motorsport focuses everybody's mind. So they've got an education component of this complex as well. Hopefully that they will get be able to get people involved with, say, the local TAFE colleges and they'll be able to take people out and get them involved in things like a Formula SAE competition or even other forms of motorsport which are like we do on Channel 31 and RMI TV. They're real-world exercises. They're not theory. They're not sort of, you know, I'm sorry, my dog, it'll be with you on Monday. The dog ate my homework. I haven't got it finished yet. Doesn't doesn't cut that. Doesn't doesn't cut it in the real world. And they're the things that students and young people are going to learn. And also, as he said, and this is something that they do so well overseas, particularly in Europe, that we just don't do it all, was focusing on you, you want to work where you're living. And that's the, one of the reasons that there's so much cash. And it doesn't matter. I, I knew very well the late Professor Paul Mees, who was probably the guru of international public transport and transport mobility. 
And he always said that there is no point, it doesn't matter how many train lines you build, it doesn't matter how many lanes you add to the Monash or to the Wellington Road or to any road that you care to, to try look and, at. To try and mitigate the congestion? The fact is, if everybody is going to the same place at the same time, there is going to be... A log jam. A, a log jam. It's going to be a bottleneck. Yeah. yeah. What you want is you want people who can come in the other direction. You want people who, like me, live out sort of, you know, the, the, the Dandenong Southampton Park area who can say, who can say I don't have to drive into Melbourne. I'm driving out to Cardinia. Or I'm driving out to Berwick. I'm driving out to Fountain Gate. I'm going in the opposite direction to where everyone else is going. Your, hab- your habitat environment will be in, in your immediate um, And the access, ideal, the ideal situation is if you can walk there. We, when we were at Le Mans years ago, we spoke to someone at Le Mans and she was horrified at the thought that she said, oh, I'm just so far away. I've got to drive almost 20 minutes to work every day. <laughs> yeah, that was our response. <laughs> Just and she, she wondered what I, what we were laughing about. And I pointed out that at the time I was working at Melbourne University and I said, I'm, I'm, I've got a 90-minute commute yeah. one way. So I, you know, over three hours a day I'm spending just commuting. And she was just stunned. Well, that's the con. And I grew up in the country, as you know, and I, I was driving sometimes an hour to an hour and a half a day to get to work one way as well, though, too. I was used to that. I know, some of the some of the difficulties people find coming from regional areas to come to Melbourne are they're dri- they're driving an hour and they're getting a hundred k's. <laughs> they come to Melbourne, they're in an hour and they get five k's. <laughs> well, I must say, when we came back from Winton, it took me as long to get from Melton where we dropped off the equipment. It took me as long to get from Melton back to Hampton Park as it did to come from Wangaratta down to Melton. That's because your tyres melted. It was 30-something degrees, <laughs> yeah, almost 40 it, that day as well it, too. It <laughs> was, but it was just... You know, basically, yeah. once I hit the west gate, I, I came to a stop. Yeah, I, I, and I did, I did the same thing on the Thursday. I went across to Melton to do the, exactly the same chain reaction and we got there. We're going to have to take a quick break here on uh, KC Radio 97.7 FM. Uh, thank our sponsors. You're listening to a special in pit lane edition for two hours here we're we only got haven't got much longer we've got to hand over the reins soon at six o'clock but uh it's great you've got brett ramsey in here on behalf of in pit lane i'm doc casey from casey radio and um we've just got together for a special here and had a bit of fun and we're going to come back after these messages and talk about uh something that's coming up in the local area that's uh, getting up off the ground here in in Dandenong. That's a huge supporter. It's great to see it's going to get some action again around the area where people can showcase their cars and you can see a little bit of insight into motorsport as well, though, too. Uh, so it's Doc Casey on 97.7 FM, the sound of the southeast.